Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Every year, the Community Service Society of New York conducts an annual survey of low-income New Yorkers. This past January, based on those findings, it issued a second of three reports called What New Yorkers Want from the New Mayor. It's called An Affordable Place to Live. The authors, Tom Waters and Victor Bach, both housing policy analysts at the Society, are my guests today. And greetings, gentlemen. Hi. So what do you think of the mayor's plan? Well, your report came out before his plan. Right, and we'll yeah. have another one right. afterwards. Um, uh, so it, it's a big, thick book that uh, nobody got to see until, until he did the press conference. And um, uh, it has the headline number that they'll do 200,000 apartments in 10 years. He'll only be mayor for eight years, but um, <laughs> uh, unless history repeats itself. And um, uh, it won't again, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but they. Um, uh, everyone said their, the report didn't have enough detail in it about how they were going to do the 200,000, which I don't really agree with that criticism, except that it doesn't have enough detail about the one thing that I wanted to know the most about, which is the, um, how they're going to raise the number of apartments that are affordable to people with really low incomes. Um, so the 200,000 uh, has a big mid in, middle income component to it that's uh, more than what... Uh, more than what Bloomberg did. That's really how they bulk up the numbers. Um, and uh, what's that? Comp what's the cost? I mean, what's the income? For uh, the middle income. I think it goes up to one hundred and sixty-eight thousand. Uh, that's not the middle income tier, but no, um, ninety thousand. It it goes up pretty high. It's yeah. well past one hundred thousand. Does, um, uh, yeah. which means you can charge very high rents right. um, and still call that affordable. Right. Um, uh, I often wonder if that's what is middle point? income people in that sense really want is more $3,500 a month apartments. Um, but anyway, then it has uh, about the same number as Bloomberg did at um, like 60000 and below. Um, but they say they're going to increase the component that's like 20000 and below, which is the, the layer that we're mm -hmm. most interested in because people with incomes like that face the worst housing hardships in New York. Um, which makes sense, obviously, if you have less money, you have worse housing hardships. Um, some people think that public housing and uh, other forms of subsidy make up for that, but they really don't. There's not nearly enough public housing and subsidized housing to compensate for having incomes that are so far below. And what are you talking about, below 30 or 25,000 uh, fast food workers? <laughs> The, yeah. cur the current housing policy system really starts stops working around thirty, that five thousand and below, and the further you go, the worse it is. So, what was the income of of the study on, on low income people? What was, what did you con what was considered the the low income? Well, the CSS definition of yeah. low income is twice the poverty line, and below. So that's about thirty five thousand. And, and below. the poverty line is. About seventeen thousand. Seventeen thousand, for, uh, for and that's three, that's yeah. set federally. The poverty line. Yeah, each year, it, each year the level is reset, and we also consider low income to be include the poor, and the near poor. Near poor going up to two hundred percent of poverty. Does it get at all adjusted because of the cost of living in a community? Uh, uh, Does the community do? The, no, the poverty line is the same in New York as it is in it Texas is. or anywhere yeah. else. Um, so that, uh, that so complicates we, it, doesn't it? That's part of the reason why we use this low income yeah. definition that, that goes to twice yeah. poverty. Um, the federal housing law is based on the idea that in New York, less than about 58,000 is low income. So their definition of low income is much broader much than ours. Mm. And, and it's true that people in New York City with incomes of $58,000 are not very well served mm. um, by the housing market. So it's not crazy to have policy mm. to help people with incomes like that. Um, uh, but it's less of a priority because the hardships are less. Um, the reason we, that we do so much housing production for people in those uh, income brackets is it's easier to provide low-income housing for people who can, who can pay fit $1,400 a month rent instead of only $350 a month. Is rent. that what rents have gone up to in public housing, NYCHA housing? That's for... A, for two-bedroom in a subsidized building that's targeted for someone making fifty six thousand the rent will be fourteen hundred because it's one forty in NYCHA you pay thirty percent of your household 30%. income there's no longer a ceiling rent mm. 
but uh, uh, we found that uh, uh, you know the uh, the uh, pros behind the mayor's affordable housing plan is really terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, it speaks to the severe rent burdens that low-income New Yorkers are carrying and the need to expand the affordable stock as a result. But we found that uh, although 92% of poor and near-poor New Yorkers have severe rent burdens, pay at least 50% of their incomes toward rent, uh, only 20% of the units in the new plan will be going toward that group. So uh, we would like to see the targeting at the lowest income levels broadened to include them. To what, include more what's, them. The, I don't, what's the median income in New York City? Does it differ from boroughs to borough? Oh, sure. oh yes, I know. But is, sure. do we have one for the whole city, or do yeah. we break it uh, down? What is it now, about 60,000? No, it's less than that, 40 or 50,000. 40 or 50,000. Yeah. So, I mean... 48, I think. It, 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 it's amazing to me that people can live here and afford to, I mean, even just with your two and a half dollars to get to work, mm -hmm. two and a half dollars to get home, <laughs> to buy food, do all these things. Yeah, we do a calculation on that, and we find that if you're poor, you have about $4.50 per household member per day once you pay rent pay everything else. The rule of thumb is 30% of your income for rent. That's what right. makes it affordable, yeah. So, so this plan, do you, have, do you think it's going to really happen? Well, they've committed <laughs> to put more money than ever before in. That's, in a way, that's the most important mm -hmm. uh, square inch yeah. of the entire thick report is where right. they say that they're going to put in a substantial increase more capital money than the Bloomberg administration did. And the Bloomberg ad administration did more than anyone else in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, so they they really are putting resources in to do something. It's eight billion, I think, over the ten years. Yeah. So the, yeah. It, well, the whole capital. project is yes. The whole project is estimated what 40, 41 40 billion something or something, billion. and it's eight billion of city. What about state? Do they? Con There's very little money from the state not in there. Contributing. Um, the state doesn't do very Good much. Good question. Yes. You know, the, uh, the Cuomo administration will point out that they have increased funding for housing, but they increased from a very low base, and it's still very low. And then, of course, they're, they're paying attention to property taxes for communities outside of New York City, so that doesn't help right. here either. Right. No, right. property tax relief uh, is mostly outside New yeah. York City. Yeah. Um, and NYCHA, the money for public housing in the mayor's proposal, is it basically just to, to redress the, the the mayor's proposal it's is not very adding. general when yeah. it comes to NYCHA. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, that's really not fully addressed mm. in the mayor's plan. Uh, we're told that uh, they will be coming out, uh, NYCHA and the City Hall, will be coming out with a preservation plan for NYCHA by the end of the year. So as a matter of fact, we have uh, a report coming out shortly that uh, that speaks to what ought to be in the preservation plan. Uh, but NYCHA is in serious trouble, as you know. Uh, uh, starting at least in 2001, it's been in uh, serious financial trouble. It's been experiencing accelerating deterioration, which uh, the report we're doing uh, confirms. Uh, that NYCHA apartments have de deteriorated to a point that is far worse than low-income tenants face mm -hmm. in the private rental mm -hmm. market. And if you take that Fair seriously, uh, as of 2011, NYCHA may have been the largest and worst landlord in the city. It's a, it's it's a terrible, terrible statement about a noted authority with an exceptional track record. Now, when the authority first started and when they built buildings, it was federal funds, basically, that built it. Right? Yeah. Yep. Federal the, capital money. Yeah. Capital money. But did the city put money into it, too? It, I, for a long the time, the city did, didn't they? Uh, the city financed some public mm. housing developments, and they put both operating funds and city capital into supporting those developments mm -hmm. that because they didn't receive any federal aid. Mm -hmm. uh, just those that were built with federal money received um, federal operating subsidies and so on. So they don't, but is there any federal money now? 
Oh, yes. There uh, is. Federal they do money the subsidy. is pretty much the only money that NYCHA has to work with. And of course, it's inadequate. It's uh, starvation funding. It's been that way for a decade or two. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the starvation of NYCHA uh, basically represents a government disinvestment, not only of federal mm -hmm. aid, but also of state and city mm -hmm. aid. States and the state and city used to assist right, with the public housing they developed. They withdrew. The state withdrew in 1998. The city withdrew in 2003. Mm -hmm. And they were as much part of the problem as uh, the federal disinvestment was. So for the funding, the funding sources for something that was such good housing is totally evaporated, so we just never can go back to that. Well, that's what we're calling for, and a number of people have on their minds, is a major capital investment in uh, upgrading and preserving public housing. But not adding to it. Uh, we can't, can we you add? can't add to it. There's a federal law passed in 1998 that says this is it. No additional public housing can be mm -hmm. in an authority's inventory. It, 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 public housing is the least popular mm. of the mm. unpopular housing programs. Mm. Mm. But uh, we're hoping for uh, a major investment of capital on the part of the city and the state. Uh, some people are calling it a Marshall Plan for NYCHA. It badly needs it. And uh, we're hoping it happens. How many residents do you know? Uh, it's uh, over half a million residents. The so city very, it's a very important. It's a very important yeah. ingredient to our housing. Right, and it's you know it's hard to imagine that the city is making an eight billion dollar capital investment in yeah. expanding affordable housing, yeah. while public housing is effectively rotting and deteriorating to a to a serious point. Uh, so I think some sort of significant, if not. Uh, similar investment needs to be made in, uh, in uh, NYCHA. And the use of, um, of private developers by moving into areas, I mean, all the incentives, the rezoning, that seems to me to be not a, a, a realist. I don't know if it's realistic. I don't mean to say it's not realistic, but I don't know if it's going to be realistic. What makes you, you think it won't be realistic? Uh, to build large buildings in neighborhoods that have trouble and need housing for poor people, right. that you're going to have a developer go in on an under inclusionary housing and volunteer to do that? I don't know. Well, I don't know, but you know, it's a, it's remarkable. We we both live mm -hmm. on the Upper West Side, mm -hmm. and we pass public housing developments mm -hmm. all the time that are smack in the same neighborhood as right. much more affluent right. high rises. Uh, very often you can't tell unless you see the NYCHA sign. Exactly, on the brown. And it's a NYCHA development. But they so came I, in after the basic stock was there. Right, the tower That's and the, the park problem. Yeah. stock. Yeah, and, it, and the neighborhood. I don't know if you can really develop new neighborhoods, but maybe you can. I hope you can. Well, I mean, the city has built some neighborhoods practical, you know, mm -hmm. areas where there is mm -hmm. so much abandonment, right. and so much fire in the 70s that they've right. built neighborhoods almost from scratch in the Bronx and parts of Brooklyn. Right. And, and, mornings, and, and up in they look very Manhattan nice. Valley all over But it's easy, easier to build from scratch than to deal with yeah. an existing right. community. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the problems. And then whether the communities are easily accessible and transportation and all of that kind no, of thing. I think they will ha they'll, have to use, they'll have to use subsidy, including the federal low-income housing mm -hmm. tax credit, to get those buildings built. Because I mean, the idea of the inclusionary zoning is, you know, if if the right to build a square foot of uh, housing at a location is worth $500 a foot, which is in a lot of places in the city it is. Um, in other words, when you buy vacant land, you pay $500 per foot that you can build there under zoning. That means if you give that developer another 10,000 feet, that's $5 mm. million. Mm. And so if this city sort of takes back half of it through a um, affordable housing uh, requirement, you've got half of whatever I just said, um, in subsidy to pay for that housing. But in other places, in, in, in uh, low-income neighborhoods, it's only $50 a foot. So it's not, no longer is the expanded zoning right mm. a rich source of subsidy. Right. You need some it other varies. subsidy right, right. to get it built. So they'll have to use their other tools. But right. they, 
That's why there's lots of money in the plan. But you know, a lot of uh, public housing communities, and I do a lot of work with resident leaders in public housing, uh, would like to see some improvements in their community. I mean, apart from uh, oh, repair and upgrading, right. they'd like to see more retail and commercial uh, facilities. Uh, uh, they, they would like to see very often more senior housing. If there is residential development on, on the Tower in the Park site, they'd like that to be accessible to senior residents and the hope is uh, that when senior residents make the move into a new building, they'll get the building. That yeah. they will have the large apartments that seniors right. are occupying for yeah. larger houses. That's one households. of the problems that we have in the city, isn't it? That the the lack of mobility to move from one thing to another has right. been reversed. I mean, I remember when Mitchell Lama started. The thought was you'd get young families in there, yeah. they'd be there for a while, and then they'd be able to afford something else. They'll move out. Mitchell Lama wasn't. I don't think, if I, if I remember correctly really conceived of being a lifetime residence for people, was it? Well, I know public housing <laughs> wasn't. Uh, yeah, I don't think... Was Mitchell I don't think I don't Mitchell, Mitchell Lama was explicit. either. But of course, it, that's what it is. And so you can't, you, you, you can't move people out, so you can move other people, and you have to wait until they die or so move. But then, I, I don't know how I sing it reverse. So you don't get that mobility, but what you do get the mobility is in a neighborhood like ours, where the housing is so expensive, they're going to move to other neighborhoods where it's less expensive, and they're moving there gentrifies that neighborhood and makes it more expensive. So then they, the people who lived there before, have to move and move and move. So right. it's not moving up; it's moving down. And that's how and do we this, stop and that? And the city is growing, uh, yeah, so that the they demand to estimate a million more is, people than is it. huge. Uh, right. And uh, if you if you're at the bottom of the barrel and can't afford to keep up with right. rent, you're in serious trouble. So if we had eminent domain, we could just walk in and <laughs> take over whatever. Under land. you, yeah, eminent right. domain. Or we could make everything a parkland. How would we do that? Then we can build on it. I don't. I mean, the basic problem is the private ownership of land, which I guess is. Right. Basic well, that's to why, the, that's the why, existence of this country, right? That's why NYCHA real estate is so tempting. Uh, there is a shortage of land for residential mm. development. Mm -hmm. The city does need to expand its housing base. Mm. And so those uh, public housing communities are very much uh, mm. in the eye of developers as possible sites. And there are other advantages. Uh, the tower in the park model. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of talk about integrating that into the fabric of the community with more robust uh, street shopping and so on. There's a lot that could be done if uh, the housing authority went about it right, with care. Way. Now, the new chair, yeah. uh, Shola Olatoye, yeah. uh, seems to be in the process of engaging residents and developing a new relationship of trust, so we'll see. I think that was essential. I mean, here it was right. Bloomberg, this, the, the multimillionaire, saying we're going to build big this houses. This is where it's going to be. Yeah, and the fear, you know, just became overwhelming. Well, they were, the residents found out they, their, their developments were targeted yeah. by, through a leak in the Daily yeah. News. That was how they found yeah. out. And the, and the plans didn't have anything in them to benefit yeah. other than the money. Um, other to than the, the towers, they, you know, th there's no community center, there's no school, there's no commercial yeah, space, uh, yeah. just the maximum Retail number of space. units yeah. crammed into a place where you can build as of right and avoid the ULERT process. Now, if you could build there, does that money go to the housing authority or does it go to the city? If it generates revenue, as in the case of uh, the strong market areas where the lease arrangements can be very advantageous to NYCHA, that will generate revenue, and hopefully some of that will go toward uh, upgrading the surrounding public housing. I don't mean to be cynical, but at the same time, the money that came in lieu of taxes from Barry Park City has not gone to housing the way good it was point. supposed to, right? Another good point, And that's yes. a lot of money. That's right, that's now, right. Now, why has that not happened? Well, the city has tended, uh, with some exceptions, to roll the Battery Park excess revenues, which were mm -hmm. supposed to be dedicated to affordable housing outside of Battery Park City, mm -hmm. 
outside of that luxury mm -hmm. development, the city has rolled it into its general revenues. So it means uh, uh, prying it loose from the city yes. budget. So is that, it that's not be. in the mayor's plan? The, the mayor's plan does have money from Battery Park City. Oh, it does. And Bloomberg put some of it in too, although not small amount, not all yeah. of it. But, but I think I think it is a capital pool yeah. that ought to be seriously considered for being dedicated. Right. Uh, right. So you you really think that the the um, theory of inclusionary housing is a good one? Well, I think that what they're really <laughs> what, 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 I think what the de Blasio administration means when they say inclusionary housing isn't to make a rule and have that rule apply everywhere. everywhere. It means to negotiate what they think is the best benefit. And on the table get. it is 50 percent, could be 50 percent. It's never going to really be 50 percent low. Depending on the really, community. Really, your, your definition of low, do you think? Uh, I don't know. We, I don't hope, know. we oh, hope. At double <laughs> poverty, that would be very difficult to yeah. do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, I think that's why they put deal makers like Carl Weisbrod and Alicia Glenn in the key positions is because the, they see this as a process of making deals where they will try to negotiate the best they can get um, is that good? against, did, against all these developments. Domino, you know, uh, yeah. deal by deal. Yeah. yeah. That's good public policy or not? If it works, it's it good works. public it would be. It would actually be very hard to make a consistent rule that would work all over, yeah. on the Upper West Side and in right. central Brooklyn, and right. in the central Bronx, right. and in Bay Ridge, and everywhere else. The, the city is heterogeneous enough that um, you, you're probably stuck being a bit transactional about how you do it. So what, do you, what would you recommend in addition? What would you, if you had your druthers, what would you like to see? Uh, more money to support operating subsidies to make housing affordable to people who, with a really low incomes. People who- That's like, is that like section eight? Yes. And also just, the, the money that you give to a person to make the difference? Or was that just temporary to prevent homelessness? Well, if you, you know, if it costs $600 or something like that at a minimum to operate an apartment. So if the tenant can't afford $600 a month in rent, mm -hmm. you need an, an additional subsidy mm -hmm. uh, to make up for that. Um, it, could be, it could be a cross subsidy from a higher rent in the same building, although Right. Uh, but you don't want it to be an emergency subsidy. You want it to be a permanent. I mean, an as ongoing long as the person, uh, yeah. right. operating right. subsidy, the way public housing right. has. Right. Since the late '60s, they realized that uh, you know public housing was supposed to support itself on tenant rents, right. and it, uh, as of the late '60s, it could no longer. So the federal government supplies operating subsidies as one of its uh, assistance streams. So, in order to cover the gap between what it costs to operate right. and what tenants, low-income tenants, can pay for rent. S and Section 8 is that the money comes from the federal government. That's right. right. It's and allocated it, locally, but right. And has it? It's best. gotten smaller. <coughs> it stopped growing, and it is. It became s smaller as a result of the sequestration, and the, the House just passed a budget that would make it even smaller. There are no, no additions. Um, you know, it, it's a battle to try to keep it flat when the need is growing. The Section 8 waiting list is now closed. Yeah. Because there's no, no room for additional vouchers. There's a school of thought that I saw that instead of doing inclusionary housing, have the developer pay extra money into a fund. Um, that so the, the, the problem so they can be housed elsewhere? Yeah. Well, that was, <laughs> you take the money instead because I think they were talking about it because this one apartment house in Ab is at Abington Square that it costs 550 what, a thousand, I don't know, something, it was a very expensive unit, yeah. but I don't know. Well, I mean, that was a unit that was targeted to fairly high income people anyway, so. It's also a, it, it part, part of the problem is subsidizing a high income bracket, which half the time the newspapers will say we need to do more of, and half the time they'll say it's a scandal and we yeah. should never do it at all. <laughs> um, and, and then it's also a lot of money for that income bracket, which the city it justifies by saying it's built on a slope and they had to do some kind of special structural thing. And it also has an undercurrent that if you're really poor, you shouldn't have the same amenities that the other people in the building have. Well, the, uh, the obvious effect of, of just charging money for the Manhattan location yeah. and building the yeah. low-income apartment in the Bronx is yeah. that you have more income segregation, right. which these 
it is a goal of affordable housing policy to do something about income segregation. It, maybe it's not the first goal, but it's a goal of the policy. Has it always been income segregation? It used to be over shorter difference, distances, right? right. The, 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 it used to be yeah. only a few yeah. blocks from the, from, you know, right. back in the 19th century. Right. Uh, the, the, the best district was only a few blocks from uh, five and points. And the disparities weren't as great either. I mean, you know, I remember when this building went up, 50, 15 Central Park West, I saw this sign that said, residents start at $5 million. <laughs> I was appalled. But now, that's nothing. Yeah. How do we, I mean, how? <laughs> well, something that's else is driving those, those <laughs> you know, the, the, the $100 million apartment. That's, that's, there's something else going on there. <laughs> It's um, that's unique to the stratosphere of incomes. It yeah. doesn't relate to the rest of us at all. But we need to coordinate a lot of things, I think, in order really evident to eventually have an ideal situation for housing. I mean, you need to coordinate financial tax things and not only property tax, but the how you pay income tax and how you do all. I mean, it's so complicated. I, I haven't expressed myself very clearly, but. It seems to me if a Russian person, and I don't mean to attack, it's not an attack, comes in and buys an apartment for $80 million, but his business is in, this, in Russia, and he does, when he comes here, he doesn't do any business, what, is he paying a very high income tax? No, I don't think so. Oh, no. He's probably not paying any yeah, income tax, right. and, and with the 421A yeah. tax benefit that he's yeah, probably it's, receiving, it's, not paying property tax it. either, or minimal so, property tax. So, in other words, we're very optimistic about this this policy and we and everybody's going to work very hard to get yes. it enforced yes. and you're going to lobby and you're going to bother everybody until we see right. that it gets done and we're going to push for uh, the lowest income new yorkers to get included thank you yes. I, I, we've come to the end of this program which is oh my i'm goodness. sorry <laughs> so thank you tom thank you vic and, it's a pleasure and i hope that you'll come back and we'll um we'll do something and also you you have the report on your website so people can go to that website and look for it Right, right. Good. And more to come soon. Okay. Right. Oh, more to come. An answer to the problem. Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, man. Thank you. Gentlemen. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.